So good afternoon everyone and welcome to the posting session. So uh, I welcome my co-panelists also. So I'll briefly introduce all of you with my panelists and then we will start the session first. So I'll introduce the lady in the session first. So Anisha Raga. She's a seasoned HR professional for more than 15 years of experience and she has led Center of Excellence team at Edifice and her expertise lies in the all HR verticals including the COEs like Diversity and Equity, CSR, Employee Development and Org Design. She has a proven track record of esteemed organizations like NextGen and Round Glass. She shaped a lot of impactful HR strategies for these organizations and has a good hand in fostering employee engagement and facilitating organization growth. She is known uh, to build strong relationships and promoting positive work culture. Anisha is a trusted leader who prioritizes employee well-being. She, she has also contributed you know, immensely in various HR forums for her you know, sharing insights, making engagements and inspire the young professionals for their forward-thinking approach. So she is truly visionary and uh, driving success and growth in, for the individuals and the organization. So please put our hands together for Anisha, please. I have another co-panelist, Ms. Gaurav Mehta. Gaurav uh, is an HR professional and occupational and he is a trainer by passion. So Gaurav possesses about 20 years of experience across IT, ITS and infrastructure domain. He has delivered on numerous change management projects on various business life cycles from startup to maturity and he is part of a lot of mergers and acquisitions of private equity takeovers with the organizations like G Capital, UGS, Systems and Reliance. Currently he is associated with as an AVP uh, for APAC at Cvent and managing total rewards in HR operations. And he works in a very, very highly matrix environment. His passion lies in designing sustainable HR programs based on a blended approach to people analytics, HR technology, human behavior, and business strategy to attract, engage, and retain talent. He is an alumnus of Asian Institute of Management, Manila, a Harvard co-founded business school because Learning never stops, so he is currently pursuing PhD from TESS. So please put your hands together for Gaurav. And Sanjay, so Sanjay Roy, Rai, he is currently working with Ecom's Drugs and Pharmaceutical Limited. He is a competent professional coach for more than about 26 years of experience in the area of human resources. He had worked in air defense operations. He was actively working for legal activities. He had worked in corporate planning, industrial relations, labor welfare, L&D. And this includes managing field set force, multiple, he has handled multiple manufacturing plants and handled big greenfield projects. He worked as a bridge between the organization of big four consulting firms while you know, uh, doing mergers and acquisitions and turnarounding the businesses and worked in manufacturing excellence and HR transformation projects. So currently he is working as a Vice President Corporate HR at Ecom's Drugs and Pharmaceutical Limited and, uh, uh, and operating out of Mohali, Chandigarh uh, and Mohali. The role, his role, current role includes developing a strategy plan, HR initiative to achieve and promote behavior, culture and competencies as they are turning around an NCLT project into a uh, profitable venture. So, Thank you, Sanjay, Anisha, and Gaurav for joining in for this session. So, uh, once again, uh, greetings and uh, let's you know discuss on. It's, it's a very very intense topic, you know, alignment of HR with the business strategy. So, I'll just spend about five minutes that how the current landscape of the organization or the business looks like. So, currently, you know. We have just recently moved out of COVID and I would say that there is a lot of uh, disruptive as well as the current environment is full of opportunities. When I am saying disruptive, it is because what works today may not work tomorrow and there is a lot of uncertainty. 
to the you know, all around. But then when we are saying that it's full of opportunities, because it gives hope. Whenever there is a disruption, you can always there is opportunity that you can create, recreate, you can add value, and this is for all, not only for HR, but for all the you know functions, all the verticals, organization, all across the you know value chain. So uh, now we talk about you know what are the business drivers. So whenever we talk of HR strategy, I think it is very important to understand that what drives, what is the business context, and what are the drivers of the business. Like if the driver is innovation, then you have a very very different approach in an organization while we are developing people, retaining people, you know, or or for that matter, hiring uh, approaches. If the same is for service, probably, you know, in the last session also we heard about that service industry has a very, very different approach, you know, than probably manufacturing. And then cost, like companies like Walmart, they have a very different approach towards the, you know, the complete HR strategy. So, with this thought, you know, uh, I would also like to highlight some of the trends which are emerging in the HR space or so to say in the business that what is what are the you know the uh, key four or five elements which are currently you know are the buzzwords or deriving the business context. So first probably to my mind is the flexibility which the organizations are currently uh, you know the organizations which have had flexibility they have and the speed to adopt to the existing environment. In COVID also we have seen that how quickly they have bounced back, they have changed the employee policies, way of working, changed the org structures. In the last session also we heard that, you know, organizations are, because otherwise it would not have possible to, you know, pace up with the, that kind of a disaster or the situation. So flexibility, I think now going forward has to be a strength in an organization. I think we have to develop it as a strength. It, it can't be like one of the elements. It has to be a real strength of an organization because as I told that what has what is working today may not have may not be able to work tomorrow. So the agility, flexibility has to be the important at the core in terms of an you know, organization. The other important element which you know comes to my mind is that the changing skills for the future and the changing skills for the future with respect to HR probably are a couple of things you know I think we all should ponder upon. One is that what kind of analysis we are doing maybe if the, the theoretically saying we call it predictive analysis that if we have the data are we using it for doing simulations are we seeing the trends are we using it for you know seeing the behavior of employees or do we know how, if we know predictive analysis, do we know how to run various models, etc. So it is very important that, you know, we, because it, the environment is very, very dynamic. We are in a global world and there are smaller organizations, larger organizations and big organizations. So we, we can't be untouched with the new concepts, new learnings, etc. The other thing is that how to make a, uh, a consonance between the tech and the touch. That's a very, very important thing going forward because we are talking technology, digitization, even in a smaller organization, MSMEs, small, uh, you know, a small run businesses, because everybody wants to leverage the digitization. But then, is digitization is going to replace the touch? I think that's a very important thing that how we can, you know, the, uh, the empathy was in used word in the morning that how we can ensure that in the entire value chain with the digitization with you know new technologies coming in how we can make sure that these two have a lot of consonants uh, one more important thing you know how the how the uh, so I think uh, one more important element I would like to touch here is that within the organizations now, the 
know, there is a lot of conflict between you know how to support the growth, how we can work like an amoeba, you know when the businesses is thriving, you can scale up quickly. When it is you know when there are challenges, how we can you know bring it down. So that's one ability as HR professionals. I think we need to build in with empathy and to support the business drivers. So these are three four things you know which come to my mind uh, you know on the feed. And now I would request you know my panelists here that if they can speak about you know some of it and then maybe we I'll ask some my thoughts again which ask in the form of questions. So Gaurav. You want to add something? Yeah. Okay, so uh, you know uh, I worked with uh, very polarized organizations, right? Uh, Ten years with Reliance Infrastructure across many projects, right? So I've seen the uh, blue wallet workforce, the white wallet workforce, the transformation agenda, and whatnot, right? The uh, present organization is an IT products company I work with. Right? Uh, very different. Um, our uh, HR cost is 75%, whereas Reliance, in contrast, was more capex heavy. Right? Uh, so I'll, I'll probably be able to give you uh, stories from both the worlds, right? relevant to the group. So uh, my insights will be more of industry agnostic. Right now, uh, uh, Arun, thanks a lot for setting the context. Uh, I don't think we'll be able to justify all of it in, in the next 45 minutes, uh, uh, but we'll try to make it as uh, rich as possible. Right. So uh, often, what has happened is that if you look at HR, and I might sound a little radical, uh, you might not like it, but let's just face it. Right. HR. Payroll is outsourced. HR help desk. You know, chat GPT has taken over, chat bots have taken over. Right? Your talent acquisition is handled by an RPO or set of RPOs. Right? Um, your employer value proposition is probably being handled by somebody who works on branding sitting out of the marketing department and you give him or her inputs, right? Uh, employee relations, great, but, you know, uh, would you really want to tag it as a full-time job, right? Maybe yes, maybe not. Uh, I, I have my doubts, right? Uh, your compensation, not the administrative part, but the meteor part of it, like the budgeting or the modeling, can be done by FPM, right? So we might not like it again, but has HR department become an aggregator? We have to ask ourselves, right? Now, what has happened is because most of the work can be done by others, or is being done by others, the expectation from HR has increased a lot, right? What's the value you are adding, not as an aggregator, but as a value creator, right? And I hope, you know, and, and it's like, you know, wake up and smell the coffee moment for all of us, right? And we've seen it happening for, for the last five years, right? And we still don't wake up, right? All the best, okay? Now, there have been a lot of unrealistic expectations also from HR, right? You can't expect HR to do the thinking part and the doing part at the same time. The HR has, the HR man has to split himself into half. And always remember, you cut the elephant into two parts, you don't get two elephants. It's as simple as that, right? Um, you want the HR head to work on the future readiness of the organization at the same time manage COVID-like situations, the ongoing crisis. Not possible at all, right? Uh, it's like, it's like, you know, you're expecting from the lady of the house that she has to work an eight-hour job, take care of the kitchen, 
bring up your children and also be a spouse to you and spend quality time with you. Oh my god, not possible at all. Right? Uh, just very unrealistic expectations from any HR head, from any HR department. I'm, I'm just throwing it out to you, straight from the heart, a very candid situation. Uh, you know, we all face on a daily basis, right? Uh, we go through a lot of paradoxical uh, situations uh, in our careers. That's just, you know, I'm, I'm just making a point to highlight. Now, coming to what has happened off late and why, it has forced us to think about it, right? COVID happened, two years gone. Knee jerk, euphoria, we hire a lot of people for the growth we are foreseeing. Recession hits, we want to lay off, right? And probably, you know, uh, a lot of knee jerk decisions again, you know. Uh, right. So the last three years have been very turbulent for all of us. Believe me, not just for HR, even for even for business, even for sales, for that matter. Right. We're we're just part of it. Right. And that's the re reason. You know, it has it has really forced us to think that are the expectations from HR really realistic. Right. And if the CEO is wanting you to be strategic. Why isn't the thinking part of HR setting out the CEO set? And, and I'll, I'll give you a few examples, right? Um, coming from Reliance, you know, I'm still in touch with my colleagues out there. Uh, we ran a lot of uh, uh, transformation agenda out of the CEO cell. Um, and, and, and thinking very differently. Let's look at training, right? What does training do? And I'm, I'm talking about HR bureaucracy here, right? Right in the face. I'm an HR person, I hate to do it, but, but let's just face it. Training calendar. Such a mundane transactional job wherein you would do a TNI year after year, which would not change much. You would have a training calendar, you would coordinate for those trainings and cry out loud that why are we facing nomination uh, problems. We don't get nominations. Right? The CEO says, Ban kar do training department ko. Right? It's of no use. It's not adding value. Now, this is one situation. Let's look at the other situation, right? The CEO says, oh, you know what? I'm going to leverage my training department. What I'm going to do is, uh, uh, the HR had asked the CEO, what, what's keeping you awake at night? Tell me your three vexing business issues. The CEO opens up. He says, well, these are my three vexing business issues. The HR head converts or translates those three vexing business issues in three big black belt projects. Those black belt projects further broken down into smaller green belt projects. Right? And those green belt projects is handled by a cross-functional cross team. And as they go ahead on their project journey, the training needs, just-in-time training needs, just come in there. They say, well, you know, this group needs a quick training on maybe Minitab, you know, or analytics, or um, cohesiveness while working in a cross-functional group. That's when they will absorb the most. That's when it will make most sense. Why? Because they're hungry at that time for the knowledge and they can apply live. So what is the training department doing? The training department is leading the agenda of change management. Three vexing business issues which is keeping the CEO awake at night. That's what the training department is hustling around. Right? So I'm a big fan of uh, structures and not strategy. I think strategy is the most abused word in the industry. Right? So I've just given you an example of a structure being changed. How your training department is run. And that's what we HR professionals need. You know, if you can bifurcate the thinking from the doing part, believe me, a lot will be achieved. And, and this is just one of the examples I have, right? Um, I've got a lot of examples. Like, um, we got a job family, which is uh, internet research. It's a very simple task people have to go online 
and they have to search for a specific thing and just put it in an Excel sheet, right? A lot of noise around it. Oh, you know what? Attrition is 30%. Out of 100 people, 30 people will leave. But is it painful? No, it's not painful at all. I can live with it, right? And there goes the noise. Why? Because I'm telling the CEO, you know what, it's not painful. All I have to do is out of 100 people, 30 people leave. I can start a batch in January, 15 people start a batch in July. Right? No problems at all. Please don't make any noise around it. Because it is no hiring pain. I can have them up and running in four weeks of joining. So, are we identifying that is the attrition 30% or it's just not painful and I can live with it? Right? So, how many of us see phenomena from that lens, from the business lens, is what we will be wanting to reinforce uh, through this discussion. I got many examples, so as the discussion you know evolves i'll i'll probably you know uh, give more insights with let's hear from uh, sanjay first then we'll come to anisha because anisha also comes from the it ITAs industry so let's hear from sanjay yes. i uh, i thank the chamber of commerce to be uh, i'm very thankful that i'm here so i'm able to see not many hr professionals i come from uh, uh, two parts like my entire career is in two parts I would I served Indian Air Force for one decade and then I was part of Ministry of Defense projects. Uh, IT commonness, I did my education in IT, I did my MBA in HR. So uh, there were challenges, what you call uh, the business challenges. So I consider defense as a challenge when I was part of defense where uh, I was actively participated in Kargil War. So I've been uh, you know, decorated with a medal called and the today's strategy where we are. So, first of all, we have to define human resource once again. That why the human resource department itself is required in an organization. Once everything can be outsourced, then why human resource department is required is a very big question. It's not about recruitment. It's not about compensation, onboarding, or you know, running the PMS. It is all about empathy. I will give you uh, certain examples that the most advanced organization in this world, probably uh, Microsoft, Oracle. If you compare the attrition rate or turnaround rate, they are on a very higher side. Compare to an organization which is driven by an Indian with value systems and they reach out to the people because uh, I, I first time when I entered in the corporate world I got to know about the turnaround here to 10 percent, here are 20 percent, here are 20 percent. I was surprised that our workers ka turnaround is so much. They were having no calculation. कि हमारे वर्कर्स जो आप जिसको ब्लू कॉलर एम्प्लॉय बोलते हो और जिसको कैजुअल वर्कर जिसको रॉन्ग वर्ड है बट आई एम यूजिंग इट इट्स हार्स रियलिटी ऑफ इंडिया दैट हाउ वी आर ट्रीटिंग इट समबडी आई यू नो समबडी आस्क अ वेरी रेलेवेंट क्वेश्चन इन द लास्ट सेशन द जनरेशन व्हाई द न and we have to catch up the speed. But the core values of uh, human being should remain in that organization, that is the soul. Once we try to get the challenges, once we are in the road road and try to uh, draw a road map for the, you know, the challenges which we anticipate in future or the current challenges, then we have to design it and design it in context, the criteria should be your value system and culture. I will give you a small uh, definition of culture which you may not get in your textbooks. But I meet so many people on the leadership hiring and uh, from a top uh, reputed issues they come from, they represent a very big organization. When I ask what is your organization value, they are black. 
you ask yourself this question that you may have worked in two, three organizations. What are your value systems? And culture is what? You can hear n number of talks on the, you know, strategy, n number of talks. But in practicality, culture is the values which are defined in the organization is being reflected by each and every employee, including white, blue, a security guard or helper. I'll give you another example because uh, I'm a specialist in turnaround projects. So I was representing one of the healthcare, uh, it's called Max Healthcare. We have a hospital here also in Mali and they are uh, now growing. So there is a hospital in Patinda. So since inception, this was a bit negative. The building was one of the best. It was the green building. It, it was awarded at green building award. The doctors were from the same colleges where you know, in the Mohali or in Delhi, uh, the doctors are. What was missing? When we did a lot of brainstorming, a small word which has come, which is called Seva Bhav. If a patient is not getting Seva, and the doctors and the nurses, they don't have this dream that any sick person who comes to the hospital will go back to his home recovered, healthy, happily, quickly. So, they will not look at the kind of bills what they are having, the number of days the patient stay in the hospital. The seva how once anybody, be it doctor, be it nurse or be it anyone, if you have a small <coughs> seva how which is again embedded with the value system, I am also talking about not organization, but your own value systems, family value systems. <coughs> so once you start and we did uh, a training program on that, so we asked everyone to have say or how, anybody who enters, uh, suppose uh, you lead uh, the HR team there, a housekeeping guy enters in your cabin, you as an HR head has to give the best services to that person who has entered with some complaint or maybe grievances, maybe some suggestion, anything. But he should go and talk to the other people that the head or the team member has reacted, responded with a sense of seva bhav and is happy, content. So, the AI, chat, GPT, machine learning, these things will keep on happening. Do you think there is no change in your life? Every day there is a change. When I was in class 5, my dreams were different and today I am here because of certain challenges. Anybody who has designed, when he was in class 5 or in high school, he was passing high school, they designed their career. We are the results of changes happening in our society and in our organization. I am giving absolutely different way of thinking about HR. So you will not get in textbook. So this is my experience when I was part of defense forces, part of government's policy framing part, when we also had that empathy embedded in our policy, government policies, which will come next year. 2024, we are going to have a policy on NBC, nuclear, biological and chemical warfare. So there also the empathy part plays. I will give you an example of COVID. When COVID happened, everyone was in panic. But by design, empathy was already existing in our system. So somebody, you know, uh, somebody in the packaging line, sorry, uh, uh, we have, uh, uh, we are manufacturing medicines. So in the packaging line, a girl was sick. That time COVID was not there, but my team reacted so well, they went to the family and uh, the family also reacted well. Immediately, she, within two days, she recovered and she came back and uh, on 21st of March, I think uh, the Prime Minister addressed the nation that, you know, we'll have a lockdown. And we opened up that day. We opened up that day when the country was locked down because medicines are required 
for the uh, I don't think uh, now we have to uh, do the right scaling so that you know uh, we are uh, relevant to the world. So that is what I think. Thank you, Sanjay. What's your view on it? I think, uh, first of all, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my right hand side is manufacturing, infrastructure. I don't know what IT will talk about it. But uh, I think um, I thought not to talk about COVID thing uh, today. But I think from the very first session, we are talking about COVID, and we got was spoke about a uh, little bit of the things. I think as an organization, uh, when we say human resources, people and culture, I think we have some job to do there, right? Uh, if I tell a story about my organization, I come from Eritrex Technology, we are based out at Mohan. Uh, when, when COVID hit us, trust me, there was a zero impact on the productivity for us, right? And I was hearing, you know, during the COVID times when companies and HR come and talk about it that, you know, during COVID, we, we created a task force, we offered a vending services uh, for the organization. Why we were not thinking earlier about those things, right? COVID is not something that hit us first time in the past. If you see the many, many histories, there are a lot of pandemic happens in the past, right? You, you heard about Spanish flu, where 500 million people got impacted, which comes close to 50 crore, millions of death happens. I think industries, like Sanjay men mentioned, that industries keep changing, evolving, and change is happening every time. Why HR was not ready for such kind of pandemics, right? A, a well-being offering is something which is always must, always must in the organization. I've heard uh, in one of the HR forum where, you know, one of the HR said that, you know, we started uh, insurance for for employees. Insurance is something, a very basic well-being services that every organization should have, right? So why we're talking about that, you know, these things needs to, we have to think post, uh, post uh, uh, COVID or the pandemic. I think as an HR, it's a responsibility for each of us to be ready, to be thoughtful, on the projection that what can be next. So that's one thing on the COVID. And uh, when I see HR, I also see my country as an in Indian. I'm, I'm reading uh, one of the articles in the newspaper in the morning in the Economic Times. Uh, Prime Minister is having a back-to-back -back meetings in US where he has a series of meetings with uh, you know top-notch manufacturing companies. He met GE, he met Elon Musk, he met, you know, uh, the CEO of the Microns. I think we are going to have a great future in India, right? A lot of jet engines, manufacturings are going to be happen in the coming years. So what is the baseline of that? If the countries like US is going to invest in India, it means they have a great, great, you know, dependency and the trust of the workforce of India, right? So we have to acknowledge this. In organization, when we say organization, HR is a very critical and a strong department. And that's the reason these companies are opening up, coming to India, wanted to do a handshake with us so that more empowerment is coming, more strategic thinking is coming. And that's what we have to do a value add as a human resource. So I think a lot to come in our way, right? And uh, I think. COVID, uh, you know, gave us a lot of learnings. Uh, I think let's say goodbye to uh, COVID, right? And let's see a new future uh, in, the, in the coming years. Uh, let's not haunt because COVID is something where a lot of people has lost uh, many dear, dear friends, their family members. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very bad phase of everybody's life. So thankfully the COVID has gone. And I think we have to look up, we have to think smart, we have to talk positive now. Uh, so I think no more to COVID is on that. So that's, that's from my side. Thank you, Anisha. So I think uh, I'll just summarize uh, what my co-panelists has mentioned in their talk. So uh, 
Gaurav talked about you know separately thinking and doing. I think it's very important for all of us that many a times we get operational when we you know whenever there is some idea comes up or you know something new comes up, we think that how we're gonna do it. I think the most important thing is that first think that you know the think is in thinking is important that how we can bring this change and then over a period of time we can learn that how we can manage the change management and how the implementation will happen. Other thing uh, Sanjay talked about the culture piece and that's very true that culture is not a something which is a bold down. Culture is the organization because organization is a you know living body and it embodies the values, culture, you know the manifestation happens the way people are working there or engaged. So I think it is very, very important because in the morning session when question was there on culture. So culture is not which you can bring in and post it and then you know, we change overnight. So it's built and over a period of time, you know, brick by brick, we all, you know, everybody from top to bottom has a role to play in it. Empathetic listening also, Sanjay mentioned, I think that's very important that uh, how, it, you know, normally when an individual comes, we feel that, you know, what is the trivial thing he is bringing in. But probably the issue which has bring in, it's a huge or a big for him. Maybe it's for small for you. So I think we have to give a, a very, very empathetic and the patient listening, which Salil also mentioned in the morning session that they are working on uh, and the becoming as a listening organization. Because they have suffered a lot probably from there they have learned that why listening is so important. Uh, one of the uh, important thing which uh, uh, Anisha made a point that well-being is a you know, very important aspect and which should be the bedrock of the organization because in the various studies also which has come up during this course maybe McKenzie or whosoever they are saying that in the new uh, age well-being is the most important concern including the mental health. So we all have to think about, we have to make our organization you know, uh, go back, sensitize people that how we can ensure that well-being and the, you know, the mental health piece remains a very, very important agenda in the, especially in the HR domain. So with this, I think uh, one more important aspect I you know, want to mention here that as HR and otherwise, because there's a lot of anxiety of this machine learnings, AIs and all that. I think we have to make the organization live with it that how along with machine, we, you know, as humans will coexist and how we help, the, you know, uh, 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 employees to manage these anxieties. I think that is also one of the most important things which we have to deal in the future. So probably keep thinking about it. You know. So I have, you know, uh, let's move to the second phase of this conversation and uh, I'll ask uh, some questions which come to you know, my mind and I've planned something. So I, this question is for Gaurav, that you know, one of the common critique, you know, we HR professional listen and hear that we don't have a lot of business knowledge. So what message would you like to give to the youngsters that how we should and how as HR professionals should keep a tab on the what is happening in the business. So, uh, in my last 21 years of you know experience, uh, I think I'm one of the most hated guy after this uh, in this in this uh, call. Uh, the most successful HR heads I've seen have come from the business side, right? And and I'll tell you why. And there are reasons for it. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll give it to you with examples. Uh, this person came from sales and uh, he said, well, you know what? I'm losing my top 30% high performers. What can be done? We brainstormed. We came up with a framework called Hooks at play per year. It's just a way of putting a new idea, a new concept across. Happy, happy framework. Hooks at play per year. Though hooks were not tracked for each high performer on a yearly basis, but they were tracked on a quarterly basis for the high performer. 
So for these top 30% aggressive sales guys who are thirsty for recognition, who are thirsty for promotion, who are uh, thirsty for media assignments, uh, we had, you know, what's hitting this person this quarter? Is he being promoted this quarter? Is he being, uh, you know, sent for uh, I am management development course in this quarter? The next quarter, is he uh, getting his uh, ramp up commission or a big payout or a retention bonus? And the fourth quarter, are we loading him with, with something he has not done before? Are we preparing him for, for a future role? Right. A happy framework. Um, I wish um, you know this becomes part of of our everyday thinking. Right. I'm giving you examples so that you can appreciate what I'm trying to convey. Right. Um, let me uh, give you another example. Right. Another person from business uh, coming into HR, uh, structured rotation is what I'm talking about, wherein uh, these professionals spend about 6 months to 12 months in HR, uh, look at things from a different point of view, different angle, right? bring in a lot of insights. Uh, early warning system. right? Uh, there are a lot of off-the-shelf products, but yes, they don't help. They're expensive. They're, the algos are not revised. You know, you buy it and it becomes redundant because you're not revising those algos in the background. Right. Uh, very simple things. Uh, in in uh, uh, one of the organizations I worked with, we gave a lot of freedom on people browsing anything and everything on their uh, laptop. Right? And which is legend. They could go on LinkedIn, apply for jobs, go on IM jobs, apply for jobs, <laughs> right? Three variables is what we worked on for predicting my uh, attrition. A, that what is the score, the browsing score for the person? We saw that people, uh, you know, hits on apply in their search jobs coming in. How frequent is a person going on to LinkedIn? Right? Uh, is the person going on uh, you know, different companies' ATSs? Like he's going to work day of a different company, you know, he's going on uh, greenhouse or any of the ATSs, right? Or hybrid. We could track that. Right? So that was the first trigger. The second trigger was the persona. Right? What is the person sitting at? The market positioning that I'm talking about. The person type. Uh, well, you know, he's sitting at maybe P10, P25 of the range. The third variable was as simple as how much time has it taken to get promoted. Right? So, so just simply these three variables, the message behind it is that we could leverage the mind of that business person who came into HR for those 9 to 12 months. Right? What I'm trying to say is that we get business people. Come into HR, why can't we have HR people go into business? Mandatory, six months you'll be working with business. I'll give you another example, right? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a through and through total rewards person, so I understand job architecture because by virtue of HR ops being part of me, I have a lot of data on so what do I do with it, right? Uh, the business head comes and he says, well, from the headquarters we have a mandate, we can't give more than 5% this year. And maybe next year also. And I'm talking about on infrastructure. Ten years I've spent in infrastructure, and believe me, uh, uh, one of the regulated businesses I worked for was the electricity distribution. We work on. Uh, we can't make more than 12 to 30 percent profit, right? And most of the profit is in form of regulatory assets. We're not able to recover. So of course, four percent, five percent is an every year story. Uh, what we did was, uh, and we had not done it for the last. Uh, uh, five years, what we did was that the processes had matured so much, right, that what a diploma engineer trainee was doing could be done by a tradesman. 
and what a graduate engineer training was doing could be done by a diploma engineer right just by revising those job descriptions just by divide you know dividing the work in a more uh, mindful way we saw that oh, you know what we were hiring 100 gts for the year all we need to do is maybe hire 100 tets instead of gts right uh that's where the budget gets controlled instead of hiring uh, 500 dds let's hire 500 tradesmen for that matter right and you would not believe we kept the budget the compensation budget flat just by doing this for three straight years flat i'm not talking about 5% i'm talking about flat wage bill despite of giving maybe more than 5% for this matter right uh so clearly you know with 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 all the uh, uh discussion three major themes are coming in you know when it comes to business alignment is what the topic is that hr can we have a bold conversation with the ceo with the promoters with the investors that sir a ma'am three themes is where we can add value you choose a Theme A is your delivery part, the doing part, right? Your HR operations, employee experience, onboarding, full final settlements, uh, employee relations, right? Uh, the mundane transactional payroll, right? So on and so forth. B, the soft aspects like uh, Sanjay spoke or Anisha spoke. You know, the culture, the context, the behaviors, right? the the psychological fabric of the organization right what holds key to the change management in that organization right is it a conflict between legacy employees versus new talent phenomena and the third aspect is the thinking part the data the the strategy uh, right so where do you want us to make an impact out of these three things and maybe maybe the future of hr department uh holds with maybe restructuring the department maybe hr dep department the ceo the, the the progressive ceos will say i don't want any hr department i want the thinking part sitting under the ceo self the uh, behavioral part being handled by uh, somebody who understands behaviors psychologists uh you know uh, behaviorologists uh, and i want the doing part the delivery part to be done by techy Why? Because he understands how the LMS works, how my HR LMS works, how I can install a bot, right? And how I can probably, you know, deliver on to, uh, uh, you know, by by zero error payroll, right? So I want a techie out there who understands it. So maybe uh, again, you know, this is this is. If I were a CEO, I would love to. Thank you. Thank you, Arav. uh quick question sanjay and we are we are running short of time now if you were to give one advice to hr professionals to be more effective what is and only one <laughs> so please define anyone you are hiring their responsibilities and roles should be properly defined that is the major reason why people leave the organization it's not the compensation Uh, which is a singular reason why people leave. It's about giving a role which is aligned to his passion. And if you can do that, I'm sure that you will be able to hold the nerve of the organization. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay. Anisha, quick one for you. So, growth and uncertainty. Can, can I also add? Oh, yeah, please add. Uh, Sanjay rightly said. I think one more thing that I wanted to tell you is, you know, my job profession, and it's not about hiring it's about you first right it was like gorab mentioned i think strategically we have to improve first that's the demand from the executives that they look forward right so one thing that we all have to do is the embrace continuous learning and the adaptability i think the, when we create the budget of uh, you know hr department i think first we have to keep the budget for us or ourselves right for our learning and development for our growth as well right so when when any organizations maybe you know when i when i meet in hr professionals are very young professionals 
when we ask them to know what is the mission and the vision of your organization, they are slightly black about it, right? So first you have to grow yourself, you have to keep learning. Like Sanjay mentioned about a lot of AI apps, the chat GPT and all those things. They cannot replace human resources, but they're smarter than us, right? So we we have to continuous learn, adapt, very importantly. Secondly, you have to save some time for yourself. There are a lot of things that we are into in operations activity. You have to see that how you are going to guide your management that, that automation can do on behalf of you. So at least you have some time to spend on some learning to see what is the best industry trends, what is the market looking like so that you can go back to your executives, talk on these numbers so at least they can trust you, they can see your projections and things can be changed very dynamically in your organization. So invest in yourself, if you are going to create your budget for the next year, please start have some 10-20% of the budget for your grooming, for your learning and there is, I, I think the smarter CEOs definitely approve all those things, so don't hesitate to do that. Yeah. Thank you, Anisha. So you will not. You have answered. You know, no, we'll go the, to the next question also. So, you know, no, no, no. so we we'll go to the audience now. So I think uh, the last the two important thing which Sanjay mentioned and Anisha is that you know we should hire for the role, not for the heck of filling the vacancy. I think that's very important because that's how we lose people in the infancy. You know, initially two three months a person feels where I am and not being able to perform and then there's a gap and then suddenly the, you, the person vanishes. And the other thing, learning agility, I think very fairly put across, we have to develop this learning agility within ourselves, within function and we owe the learning piece for the entire organization. So how are we developing the resources which are working with us? I think that much we owe for our departments and our function, I think very important. So with this now I open the session uh, for the Q&A and uh, we have I think 10 minutes I would request you know uh, quickly maybe 4 or 5 questions will take from the audience. Thank you. Hi everybody. Uh, so like I have a question for all the HRs basically. Uh, it's been just 3 and a half years into HR and otherwise I have experience of more than 7 years. But every time I am told that uh, Diplomacy needs to be there in HR. So I just want to know this from you all. Is it is diplomacy important to be the part of HR department? Otherwise, see, I have, I would say I am a very empathetic person. But yes, diplomacy in diplomacy, I am zero. So I am always told that you need to be diplomatic because you are into HR department. So here is a question for all the HRs. So I think uh, this is more to do with you know individual. So I would request that you can take it offline with any of us. We'll be happy to assist you. Yeah. Next. Please provide my call with this. Yeah. Hello. So good afternoon everyone, my name is Ritu and I represent academia uh, from Indian School of Business. We are talking a lot about culture this morning uh, and a lot of uh, panel members have shared different versions of how do we develop a culture. I think there was a question around uh, the generational gap. I think I would also want to share that culture to me is the highest and the most uh, uh, biggest form of mistake that an organization accepts that defines the culture of that organization. The worst mistake that is acceptable is how the culture is going to be different. Uh, my question is, um, as an HR, it's human resources, right? It's up to us how do we see them as humans or as simply resources. And the question coming out of this is, a lot depends upon how do we treat them, right? So I want to ask you guys if you have any actual on the ground recommendations in terms of enriching and empowering the employees, including the HR Can I answer this? Yeah, so 
again, uh, you can sit down <laughs> standing, otherwise I have to stand up and ask. <laughs> so, uh, it's not about culture, it is about looking at it. Uh, in the morning, somebody was talking about listening. So, do you think listening will help? Yes. So, now again, I am uh, reframing the question. Listening and understanding will help or just listening will help? Listening and understanding. So, why we miss understanding? So, most of the time, we believe uh, on uh, data and sometimes data can deceive you. Once the culture part plays is the in, in totality, the everyone reflects the same, like if your organization is Apple. So what is their culture is innovation. They are very crazy, right? They are very crazy. They can do any damn thing. So every person in Apple reflects creativity, innovation in their behavior. <coughs> so you have to adopt those values which should be reflected because I answered your question in uh, my previous uh, speech. So you have to craft the value system which is apt for your business. What happens that some culture, some values which is applicable to one business may not be valid and applicable to other business like you know I am uh, my body uh, reacts to penicillin so I have to go for antibiotics third or fourth maybe CFR so it is not necessary that some medicine is working for me it will work for you also so there uh, what happens usually organization finds a inside, inside out approach what is inside out approach is again not involving people to allow and reach to a solution where you know the participation, democratic, uh, democratic participation is allowed. So their communication also plays a very important role. Where the, you know you have a lot of idea boxes in many of the organizations I visit, but those ideas are a piece of paper. Till the time it is taken at the right way then and a decision is being taken on those idea the idea can be silly idea and can you know change the entire business so we have to value ideas and uh, again reframing the word the value systems you have to create culture is reflection of your value systems whenever you you, you discuss decide your acts whatever you do uh, that reflects the culture so i i don't think there is a singular answer to your question Thank you. Uh, I think uh, no idea is a bad idea. <laughs> with this, we we'll conclude this session and we all are here. So you can catch up with us during the lunch or maybe tea break, etc. So I think go over to you. Hello. We are just over short by five minutes. So as HR people, thank we are you, Thank you so time. much, sir. <laughs> thank you so much. It has been really interactive and learning session. And with this, we will conclude uh, this session. And I would like to invite our chair, HR committee, uh, Shri Rajji sir, to kindly facilitate uh, the uh, speakers for this session. Can we get a memento, please? Request Rajji sir to kindly. Uh, uh, Anisha. A big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. May I invite Sanjay Ji, Sanjay Satyeva Ji to on the stage to felicitate our next speaker. Uh, Sanjay Ji, please be on the stage. Thank you so much. Uh